Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret, and today we are in we are in the book of Psalms, chapter 51, and we resume our study in verse 15. So get your Bible, if you can, open it up to Psalm 51. Remember also that you can study all of God's Word with me using my audio Bible messages. And you can do that at the Scripture Verse by Verse website, which is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. Go there, choose, click, and listen. From four complete series, this is the fifth, going through the Bible in the, the last 37 years. It's all there for you. All you need to bring is your Bible and a hunger for God's Word to the Bible, versebyverse.com. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 51, verse 15. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. David is saying, God, you don't want me to pray for my sin, and you don't want me to try and make up for my sin. But it's like John the Baptist said, bring forth fruit that is fit for repentance. There are a lot of examples in the Bible of people having to make up for their sins. David was forgiven his horrible sin, but God still ordained suffering because of those sins. That's the temporal punishment for sin. Making up for sin, though, is not buying forgiveness because you cannot buy forgiveness. Penance doesn't bring forgiveness. True penance is not an attempt to buy forgiveness. Instead, it is doing good after you have done bad, and it helps to reverse the bad effects of that sin and what it has done to our soul. But we can't offer God anything in payment for our sin or in payment for forgiveness. It just You can do all the good works that you want to do, and that's fine if it helps to reverse the effects that sin has made on your soul. But it's not going to buy you forgiveness. That can only happen when we confess. The Bible says if we confess our sins as Christians, God is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. God wants a sinner to be broken over their sin. And you should feel horrible about your sin. So confess it, and God will forgive you. Because God is looking for a broken spirit. Let that broken spirit that you have over your sin cause you to fall on your knees and humbly confess your sin. That's what God's looking for. God wants to see sorrow to the point of repentance and to the point of a humble submission to the consequences, knowing that you've got it coming. And of course, I'm not talking about hell if you're a Christian. I'm talking about the temporal consequences of sin and chastisement from our Father. Now, when we have a desire to make up for our bad by doing good to try to reverse the negative effects on our souls by doing something positive, that's the fruit that John the Baptist referred to as being fit for repentance. That's what John the Baptist was talking about. And God wants that sort of thing, not to buy forgiveness, but to help reverse the effects that sin has on your soul 
and to prove that you are sincere about repentance and confession was real. 18. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. David is asking God not to punish Israel because of his sin. David says, do not do that, Lord. It is a sad thing when a godly person sins and sees others, meaning the innocent, suffer because of his sin. That just compounds the misery of sin in the life of a Christian. 19. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. When our hearts are right with God, then he appreciates the good works that we will do for him. Let me say that again. When our hearts are right with God, how does that happen? By repenting of our sin and receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. When that happens, then our hearts are right with God. Then God appreciates the good works that we do for him. <clears throat> We're not, we're not trying to do good works to earn his favor and to earn salvation at that point because we know we don't, we don't have what it takes. We're doing it out of love for him. If we're not right with God and we not have, a, have repented, and if we don't care about the Lord Jesus Christ, then we can do all sorts of good things, but they don't amount to a hill of beans in God's eyes. Verse 1 of chapter 52. Why boastest thou thyself in mischief, O mighty man? Good, the goodness of God endureth continually. God sarcastically calls him O mighty man, O mighty man. A person has a twisted bit of thinking of what it means to be a mighty man, a hero type, if they boast about the evil that they have done to others, to somebody who's innocent. And you boast on that? You're twisted as far as God is concerned. Two, thy tongue deviseth mischiefs like a sharp razor, working deceitfully. God gives some people intelligence as a gift, just like he gives some people musical talent or any other kind of skill. And like many, many musicians, some people use their intelligence to do evil. They waste the good gift that God has given them that could be used for God's glory in some manner. And oftentimes they misuse it <clears throat> by using it to plot sinful things. And they're very good. They're very successful at doing it. Temporarily, of course. Three, thou lovest evil more than good and lying rather than to speak righteousness. You can ask one of the great thinkers why a person does bad things and they will probably write 20 volumes of excuses and theories. If you ask God that same question, why does a person do bad thing? He will give you a straight answer and that answer is because they love evil more than they love good. And that's the truth because we all have a free will. We all, we all are free to choose absolutely everything that we do. It might be difficult, but we have a free will. No one can force you to sin. If you don't sin, they may force you to endure pain, but they can't force you to commit sin. Sometimes the stakes are higher than others. But we all have a free will. So if we choose to sin, it's because at that moment, 
We loved evil more than we loved good, and there's no other explanation for it. It is a horrible thing when we choose to do evil rather than good, and it's always, always a choice. Four, thou lovest all devouring words, O thou deceitful tongue. Some people are constantly putting others down. They speak words that devour. Some people say bad things about others. And I suppose it might make them feel good about themselves. But people whose walk with the Lord is good, don't do that. Because they are content. They don't have to trash others to feel good about themselves. Because their walk with the Lord is is what it should be, and they don't even consider how they feel about themselves. All they're thinking about is Jesus and how good they feel about him. Self-love, self-esteem, self-worth is not an issue to somebody who who is close to Jesus Christ. And I know I just slapped the vast majority of modern evangelicals in their spiritual faces by saying that. But that's because you're used to listening to psychological sermons, and Christian counselors and Christian psychologists who are all the rage and have been for decades, which is why modern evangelicalism is in the pathetic state that it's in. But it is true. Somebody who is close to Jesus, loves Jesus, is not concerned about self-esteem, not concerned about self-worth, not concerned about self-actualization, not concerned about self in the least. They are totally focused on Jesus and how wonderful he is. And if your preacher doesn't preach that, but is always preaching self this, self that, self the other thing, you are in the wrong church. You are supporting the wrong church so-called ministry. Five, God shall likewise destroy thee forever. He shall take thee away and pluck thee out of thy dwelling place and root thee out of the land of the living. Root thee out of the land of the living. This means to drag you away from the land of the living. So God will uproot the wicked and drag them away. The wicked are fearful of dying, of course, or at least they should be, because because they're just not ready to go, and God will drag them away from the land of the living, whether they want to go or not. Dragging assumes that they don't, and they don't. Many times, the wicked will try to hold on hard. One wicked man, as he was dying, who I knew, the nurse's who were by him, said, we never saw anybody suffer like this, mentally, spiritually, never, as they were dying. Pull me out, pull me out. It's burning, pull me out. He tried to hold on, but he couldn't. Couldn't hold on. You know, we're going to stop right there. You can study all of God's Word with me at the Scripture Verse by Verse website, and that's found at thebibleversebyverse.com. Choose, click, and listen from four complete series going through the whole Bible, verse by verse. That's at thebibleversebyverse.com. If you'd like to be a part of this ministry, you can be by praying for me and God's Word. That makes you an immediate part of Scripture verse by verse, and I'd appreciate that. And also, when you take a break from studying with me at thebibleversebyverse.com, go to the front page, click the Donate button, and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. That also makes you a part of this ministry. Until next time, Michael Moret for Scripture verse by verse. So long, everyone.